one thing I'm curious about, uh, and hopefully everybody's curious about, um, y y when you invented Ethernet, you were at Park. You talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, but a whole bunch of other crazy inventions came out that have had a tremendous staying power in the computer science field. The mouse, the bitmap display, Windows. Can you just help us understand a little bit what, what was so magical about that place at that moment in time uh, that, you know, there was that much innovation? Because, I mean, and this isn't to, I mean, you, <laughs> Ethernet's amazing, but it seems like it was amazing by itself, but also part of an incredible whole. Well, it's a complicated question that's been asked many times. So one of the keys was a guy named Bob Taylor, who was recruited to start the computer science lab at Zurich's research. He, by the way, is a uh, an alumnus of the uh, University of Texas, where I'm a professor. And uh, but anyway, Bob had, had been at ARPA and uh, funding the entire computer science community worldwide, basically. And he knew exactly who to recruit to uh, staff his computer science lab. So there was that. It was the human resource angle that Bob Taylor uh, got so right. Present company accepted. And then he uh, and then we had the nearness to Stanford. So the Xerox research was basically a, a laboratory of Stanford University. All of us, not all of us, but most of us were Stanford professors at the same time that we were employees of Xerox. So the, the idea of a juxtaposition with a a uh, academic research lab, in particular a good one, was a very healthy input. And then there was the semiconductor industry, which was growing. You may know that uh, you know, Shockley had formed Shockley Semiconductor and Intel had been founded and Gordon Moore had come up with uh, Moore's Law. And then they invented the 1103 dynamic RAM, which was the core enabling technology of the Alto. So all of that. Oh, and then there was the weather. Of course, Palo Alto weather. Why, thank you. Uh, so next question. You know, when we when we did Android, we were being acquired by Google. Google said, well, how big do you think this can be? And 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 at back then, the Motorola Razr was the most successful mobile phone. It had sold 50 million. So we said, I don't know, 50 million devices. Now, little did we know they were going to use that for kind of our last milestone payment. Um, because we might have picked a bigger number had we thought about that, or had we been able to dream big. But I'm curious for you, because, I mean, you can talk, I don't think you mentioned to this audience kind of the scale of, of Ethernet and, and, and the number of touch points that it's hit. But in all honesty, did you think it was going to get that big, have that kind of 50-year-plus staying power? Just curious. Well, that revealed itself in stages, but at the beginning, certainly not. At the beginning, we were at Xerox Research, basically building our own tools for having fun. And we built a laser printer. I wrote the operating system and the network protocols for the EARS, we called it the EARS printer, EARS, the E and EARS standing for Ethernet. Anyway, we learned to print a page per second there with 500 dots per inch, and everybody wanted to print on it, so we built an Ethernet to kind of do that. Uh, I left Xerox in 79, and there there was some notion that it could become a standard, but, you know, standards don't get to be that big. Uh, so I guess we didn't really anticipate the breakout, but the breakout occurred during the 80s. We, we learned how to sell Ethernet around IBM, uh, around uh, AT&T, sell around them. Sales took off in the mid-80s. We went public in... Uh, 84. Cisco was founded in 84. Uh, so the uh, scale began to reveal itself there. The first Ethernet card I ever sold, uh, I sold for $5,000. And then I watched the price go from our, our company drove it from 5000 down to zero uh, over a 20 year period. And that contributed uh, a lot to the scale that uh, Ethernet achieved. Also over that time period, and this is the thing that I guess I don't quite get, um, I, I've seen a lot of technologies evolve. Very few have l staying power. Um, uh, uh, people might say, well, the mobile phone network, mobile phone network has evolved from analog to digital to TDMA to CDMA, like completely different topologies, networking uh, protocols, and, and now going from, you know, and, and all the way to packet as it is in, in the latest instance. But there's a lot 
inside of Ethernet that has sustained and remained the same and not been disrupted. Um, can you maybe talk about what you know some of those things are that had lasting architectural impact that let it be so durable and sustainable over that long arc? Um, but also then maybe, and then I'll have a follow-up, but, but I'm just what is it that caused it to have such staying power? I'm going to reveal a deep, dark marketing secret now. The way it goes is this. Whenever a new technology is developed to supplant Ethernet, the marketing people have a meeting and they decide to call it Ethernet. So that over the years, Ethernet has persisted by just incorporating successive waves of technology under the rubric. Now, what's what's constant is not technically is not technical so much as it is a business model. So our, uh, Ethernet was used to be a used to be a, a, a trademark. Uh, is that's enduring, and but it doesn't stand for as I made it in my previous remarks. It doesn't stand for Aloha or Manchester or Gerald or anything like that. Here are some of the things that Ethernet does stand for: uh, open standards, internet native. Uh, build it and become, meaning advanced capacity even when there are no requirements. Uh, uh, fierce competition among the makers, and that's a, a partial consequence of the open standards. Uh, oh, and de jure standards, not de facto standards, but using standards bodies to uh, make standards. Those are the enduring parts of the Ethernet model, not any of the particular. You know, there is a, a back off. Uh, we put back off as a congestion uh, uh, fighter in the first Ethernet, and it turns out <laughs> it's still in Ethernet, even though there's no more con uh, no more congestion to speak of. But back off is now also in TCP/IP, and it's also in um, uh, what's that wireless uh, Wi-Fi? Yeah, that's what it's called. Wi-Fi used to be called wireless Ethernet. I hasten to remind you, but it's it's called Wi-Fi now. But uh, anyway, it also has back off. So back off would be actually one um, I can think of technicality that persisted over the years. But other than that, I think it's the model that I just summarized rather than any technical um, technical glitch. Yeah, I think you're being a little modest because the basic packet architecture, uh, but I but actually back off was one of the things I was thinking about because I've heard you talk about that in the past. And just for those in the audience, it, it seems simple today, but back then it didn't, right? Things start to get congested on the highway. You want to try and go faster, zip in and, and get through. Um, you, you know, back when Bob was building Ethernet, if you started to have collisions because a lot of stuff started to happen on the network, people didn't know how to properly handle that. And it wasn't that intuitive, but Bob, you said you did, I forget, you did math to figure this out? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I put, I, 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 it's a trivial proof. In fact, it just involves calculus, but it, you can show that when things get congested, the smart thing is not to try harder. The smart thing is to back off. And in other words, you optimize throughput by backing off rather than by uh, trying extra hard. And uh, yeah, I did some math on that. It got me a PhD from from Harvard University uh, after a long battle. Yeah, I try and I try and tell my son that when he's banging his head against a wall trying to study a little bit too hard. Sometimes you just need to back off a little bit. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, let's shift gears a little bit because so you were researcher. Uh, you then uh, saw the potential for Ethernet, so you became a CEO. Um, very successful CEO, very successful company. You um, uh, been a, a VC, I th as I understand it, you got a new job this past year. You're a researcher at MIT now. Um, so w talk about lifelong, well, talk a little bit about those different roles, uh, a VC, a researcher, a CEO, and what, like, are, do you see them as the same? Do you see them as distinctly different personalities? Do you see yourself as one or the other? Do they build on each other? Just curious how you think about those roles. Well, the, uni the unifying principle is to stay on the steep part of the learning curve. 
it's no fun when you know nothing and it's no fun when you know everything, but it's a lot of fun learning and going up the learning curve. So in each of my six, that's six careers you summarized there, uh, in, the goal in transitioning, and I've just recently transitioned, has been to get back on the steep part of the learning curve because that's so much fun. And uh, when, you, when you're doing that, how do you uh, look in the rear view mirror to your past roles to help you in the current one? I mean, I'm fascinated by this lifelong, you as a lifelong learner, and I have been for a while as I've watched you, because it's not a skill everyone can do. A lot of people get comfortable in what they're doing, become expert in what they're doing, and want to keep doing that. Um, but I think there's a, a, a kind of youthful curiosity that I see in you with that principle of a lifelong learner. Where did that come from? I'm not sure exactly, but one of my um, uh, t uh, lessons or techniques is I, I know how to be a has-been. So if you reach a certain level of success at something and then suddenly you change careers, you become a has-been. He, he was, you know, he was, he was great at um, doing back-off algorithms, but now he's trying to run a company. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, so you, he's a has-been now. So you can't be afraid of being a has-been, of having people disparage you for starting over, because starting over is fun, and you want you want to do it. Uh, uh, by the way, when I at three com, you 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 characterize the role as CEO, and I distinguish CEO from founder. And I, so I founded three com and was briefly a CEO, but we were lucky to have a couple of a couple of three good ones to take us into the tens of billions of dollars of uh, market cap. But it wasn't me being CEO that accomplished that. It was me recruiting some really good people to, to um, make the company successful. Hey, Bob, um, this is, uh, you probably didn't plan this, but you're pretty quick on your feet. Do you have any questions for Rich based on um, some of the extraordinary things you've done in your life that you want to try out on him or, or uh, anything you want to uh, tell him about how he should be thinking about the next chapter of his life? I am curious about the nature, the nature of standard. Android, is, a, is Android a, some kind of standard is it, or is it de, de facto or what is it? I know that's a particularly interesting feature of Ethernet is how it became a standard, uh, standard uh, and the impact that that had. But in the case of Android, what's the nature of its standardness? That's a good question, Bob. And I, you know, you you were involved in the standardization process. You had to kind of fight with IBM and even GM, who thought they had a better networking technology, even though they should have been building cars, uh, to get Ethernet positioned. And I had been involved in some IEEE standards efforts for for imaging and other things. And boy, I did not want to fight those fights. There were standardization activities around Linux for a mobile phone. And we kind of gamed the system and leveraged open source and more de facto standard. We, we created a, uh, so, so we knew that we wanted to have Android be successful. Of course, we got acquired by Google and having Google's brand was potentially gonna help, um, but also maybe cause people to be suspicious. So we, we put it and, and declared it to be an open source project. We did it, uh, we gamed that a little bit because we didn't actually form it as an open source project with lots of other people contributing. We built Android and then each time we release it, we release a new release to the open source distribution, but it's built like a top tier engineered corporate product at Google that then each cycle, the new bits get open sourced. Um, and we and we formed a ad hoc consortium that we called the Open Handset Alliance uh, of 40 different companies, carriers, handset OEMs, chip manufacturers, uh, other software providers to help give credibility to that OS development uh, and that, you know, quote standard of Android. And, and that was enough to, you know, to get that, that ball rolling and have that number of people on board. And I'll tell you, the one other thing that really helped us was Apple launching a non-standard closed proprietary operating system a year earlier and, and effectively 
uh, locking out all the OEMs, locking out all, a lot of the other people on the stack providers, and also locking out a lot of carriers because they did exclusive deals with one carrier in every market, every country they were launching. AT&T was the one they had here in the US. And so T-Mobile, AT&T in, in, in France, Bouygues Telecom, Orange, like all these other carriers needed an alternative to the iPhone. So all of those things just help propel Android and, and get that ball rolling. And it, it, uh, it just was able to adopt enough market share that it, um, it didn't need to have any other kind of standardization effort other than that coordination and then some you know, some other agreements that Google put in place to help it not get fragmented. Well, you reminded me of in the middle of uh, standardizing Ethernet at 10 megabits per second, the AT&T company approached us at 3Com and asked that we develop an Ethernet transceiver that could run at 14 megabits per second. That way they could have competitive advantage in the Ethernet competition. So we, of course, refused to build a 14 megabit per second transceiver. But then one of our engineers, our key, Ron Crane, may he rest in peace. Ron built a transceiver that you could run at 10 or 14 megabits per second. And so we sold a bunch of those to AT&T. And never did they ever use the 14 megabit per second. Uh, so people are always looking at ways to gain the. Yeah. So Bob, uh, just in closing, if you had a professorship like the Metcalf Professorship at MIT, what would it be about? And if you got a life-size, uh, lifetime achievement award, that's the tallest one you've ever uh, received, how tall would it need to be to be the tallest? Because at Ideas in Action, we want to um, celebrate you not once, but a second time. We gave you a lifetime achievement award in 2013, but we want to give you another one. And I will accept it with open arms. <laughs> yes. Okay. What was the other part? I missed the first part of your uh, question. Um, your, I know you just named a professorship, the Bob Metcalf professorship. What do you hope to come from that at MIT? Well, I have uh, I've endowed three professorships at MIT, and uh, one in writing, and one in um, internet, and one in uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship. And, uh, but if I were to, but I, I don't want to, I've been a professor for the last 12 years. I'm, I'm now emeritus professor. I want to go back to coding. I, I love the coding and I, I, I miss it. Hey, Bob, I'm going to wrap up. I have one final question for you. Um, it's a, a, maybe just a number. Uh, um, on a scale of zero to ethernet, where do you place the current gen AI wave of technology? You've seen a lot of technology waves. I'm not a, I'm not expert, but I am awestruck. And I would say we are at five. Is that a logarithmic scale or a linear scale? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely logarithmic. All the good scales are logarithmic. Okay, well, thanks, Bob. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for joining us. And um, I think that's a wrap. Yeah, so Everyone, Bob Metcalf.